Grace, peace, and mercy are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The NFL draft uh, was held recently in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, The NFL has done a great job in the last several years to make this a a really, really, really big deal. Uh, If you're not a sports fan, uh, this is where each professional football team gets to take turns picking which college players they want to have on their team. Uh, So who gets chosen? Uh, There are about 60,000 young men who are playing football in college each year. And of those, there are 59,750 people who do not get picked. Uh, So it's about 250 of the absolute best of the best, the most naturally gifted, talented, extreme athletes who are super good at one specific thing. And it's exciting for them, of course. It's exciting for the team. It's exciting for the fans. It's exciting for the person picked because this is an honorable thing. It means that, that they get to be paid a lot of money to play a sport that, that, they really, that they really love, that they enjoy. And we read through God's Word, and we notice that there is a similar thing happening there, too. As we look through the historical accounts that are written down for us, time and time again, we see that, that God is choosing these extremely special people with unique gifts to carry out important tasks for Him. We just take a, a brief look at the Old Testament, we see guys like Joseph, you know, chosen to be one of the top-ranking officials in the entire nation of Egypt, even though he was a, a foreigner. We see guys like Moses, who was chosen to lead God's chosen people up out of slavery that they were in there in Egypt, to lead them away from this powerful nation, this powerful army, and into independence. Or David, a man who was chosen to be the king of, of God's chosen people of this nation. A, a great warrior in his own right, a, a great military leader who led led God's people to a time of peace and prosperity. We look in the New Testament, we see the 12 disciples. Out of all the people alive in the world at that time, Jesus said, it's you 12. I choose you guys to be the ones that I want to follow me, to learn at my feet, to carry on my ministry once I ascend into heaven. We read about these uh, amazing people doing these incredible things and we can be inspired. It's awesome to see God working through the talents of his people to do incredible things. But sometimes we read about these things and it can have a different impact on us. It causes us to reflect. We look at at amazingly talented people doing great things for the Lord and then we think, what about me? What, what, What special gifts or talents has God given me? In what significant and, and, and special way am I uniquely talented? What, what great, amazing accomplishments has God chosen me to do for him? And if he hasn't, if he hasn't created some, some great plan, some scheme where he's going to use my amazing gifts and abilities to do amazing things for him, if I'm not one of the 250, if I'm one of the 59,750, if I don't have some extreme talent, if I don't do anything that the world would look at and say, this is a, a great thing that you've done, what does that mean for my life? What does that mean for my sense of purpose, for my sense of, of self-worth? This morning, as we read our text here, we'll learn that God has indeed equipped you and called you to do a very significant thing, to accomplish something amazing for him, something that, that you alone have been equipped to accomplish. We're going to read our text here, but as we read, I want to see if you can identify this, this important task that God has called you and equipped you to do. Our, our text for this morning is our gospel text from the Gospel of John, chapter 15. We'll read verses 9 through 17. I invite you to please rise for the reading of the gospel. As the Father has loved me, so also I have loved you. Remain in my love. If you hold on to my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have held on to my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy would continue to be in you and that your joy would be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you continue to do the things I instruct you. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends because everything that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, 
But I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will endure, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. These things I am instructing you, so that you love one another. Dear Heavenly Father, these words are yours, and so we know that they are the truth. We ask that you'd increase our faith through them. Amen. You may be seated. So Jesus is saying all of this uh, directly to his disciples on the, the night he was betrayed. So this is one of the last lessons that he ever taught them. Uh, but he's not just speaking and addressing to his disciples, he's also speaking to you. Uh, so God has, so Jesus is saying that he has chosen you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will endure fruit that matters, fruit that, that lasts, fruit that is significant in this world and in this life. And so out of all of the people alive in the entire world, God has chosen you to bear fruit for him. Now, when did this happen? Uh, it wasn't a gigantic spectacle like the NFL draft, right? Uh, but our God, as he so often does, he wraps these incredible, amazing blessings in, in very humble packages. Uh, you could say that he, he almost hides these miracles behind things that look completely unimportant and insignificant. Uh, At second service, we have the the confirmation for 17 of our our young people here at at Peace. And their outfits today give a a great hint of 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 when when this happened, when they were chosen. Now, of course, it happened before the world began, before the foundations of the world were laid. But it was at our baptism that we were given the gift of spiritual life. Uh, where God comes to us and he gives to us the Holy Spirit who now dwells within us, who enables us to know who God is and who enables us to live for him, to carry out the task that we have been anointed, appointed to do. Uh, so that's why confirmands wear white robes. Uh, it points them and us back to, to baptism, right? Because you look at the font and, and babies, usually when they're baptized, oftentimes wear baptismal gowns. Uh, us as pastors, we wear white gowns on Sundays that we call albs for the same purpose, uh, to point to a righteousness, a holiness that doesn't come from it within, uh, a holiness, a righteousness that we are, are clothed with, one that belongs to and is earned by Christ. Uh, he covers us with that righteousness. He forgives our sins. He makes us holy when he gives us that gift of faith. Uh, so looking at this text, we can, we can say, yes, you have been chosen You have been equipped to bear fruit that is significant and to bear fruit that that endures, that lasts. But I think that there's fear involved with this too, and it causes us not just to be inspired, but again to reflect, because maybe even scarier than thinking, what if I'm not one of the, the 250 best of the best who has been chosen to do something incredible for God? Maybe even scarier than that is thinking, what what if I am? And what if God has equipped me to do something significant and amazing with my life for him? We might very quickly think, I'm not not quite hero of the faith material, right? But that's the the beautiful thing about how God works through his people. Uh, Think about the people that I've already mentioned in our our sermon for today. Uh, I don't think if you talk to any one of those people during their earthly life that they would say, yes, I am hero of the faith material and I'm excited and ready to go do something great and significant with my life for God. And he does this for a reason. God does not need to team up with the best of the best of us. He doesn't need us to be strong and talented, to be the, the most elite Christian people on earth because all of the power is in him. Right? He doesn't need to team up with us at all, but he chooses to. And so he chooses to use weak, flawed people, people like you and people like me, to work through us to do amazing things. And in fact, think about the, the, the names that I mentioned earlier, and, and this is true with every single one of them. Think about Joseph. Right? How did he end up in Egypt? He was such a pest, he was so annoying to his siblings that they said, we need to sell this guy into slavery to get rid of him so that he's not in our life anymore, and then we'll lie to our dad and say that he was eaten by a wild animal. Or think about Moses, the, the leader to, to lead all of, all of Israel. He admits that he couldn't even speak very well. He says, I'm, I'm slow to speak in, 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 in speech and in tongue. Or, or David, a man after God's own heart, he commits adultery, then murders somebody to try to cover it up. Even the 12 disciples were, were nothing that significantly special. 
Uh, most all of them were, were uneducated, just day laborers that nobody would point to and say, yes, this is the cream of the crop. This is what God has done in Scripture and with all of us, right? This is the case with all of the great people that, that Scripture tells us about that, does, that do amazing things for God. They're regular, flawed human beings just like us. And again, God does this for a reason, so that in every single instance we are reminded, and the lesson is clear, that the power is not in the talents or the abilities of this individual. It's not because they're good and powerful. It's because God is, and God is working through them to accomplish these things. And so we know in us too, when God works through us, it isn't to point to the power of us, it's to point and to be a testament to the power which is within us that belongs to God. God can use even you. Right? God can use even me. Even though we are poor, miserable sinners, even though we are, are often focused in, in, on the sinful pleasures and distractions of this world, even though we so often wrestle with, with doubts and questions about our faith in God's word, even though we have weaknesses, even though we are way more likely to be one of the 59,750, God still has chosen you and appointed you to bear fruit that endures and lasts and is significant. So what is that fruit? What fruit are we talking about here? Did you, did you pick it up as we were reading our gospel text? What great task has God called you to do and equipped you to carry out? A, a task that you couldn't do on your own and no one else outside of faith could ever possibly do. It's very simple. It's, it's summed up in one word. It's love. God has called you and equipped you to love. And again, it doesn't sound impressive. It doesn't sound incredible or amazing. But this is a very unique kind of love. It is a love that does not come from the world, a love that the world does not know other than when God has shown it to us. Because this love that God has called you to love with is an unconditional love. It does not think about the person giving it. It only thinks about the person receiving the love. It only gives. It expects nothing in return. It is a love that is selfless and self-sacrificing. It is a love that is always outward facing. There are no hidden motives or agendas attached to it. God has chosen you to love. In both senses of that phrase, he has chosen to love you, to show you this unique love that is shown nowhere else in the world. And he has chosen you to love, to, to carry out this love, to reflect this love to the people in your life as well. Because it's true. We're not the best of the best, and in fact, as we already admitted here in our service this morning, we can be rightfully called equal to the worst of the worst, right? We are poor, miserable sinners, and we take no pride in it, but we know that from God's word, we can even be called the chief of sinners. We have failed God, we have sinned, there's nothing good within us that, that would cause him to look at us and say, I choose you, and yet, even though that's the case, he has. He has said, I choose to love you. And, and he has revealed that love to us in, in a way that can't be questioned or mistaken. He has written it down for us in his word. He has revealed that love to us and he shows us that love in sending his son. And in sending his son, he shows us what true love is. Out of love for us and out of love for, for God the Father, Jesus held on to his father's commands. Okay, that means that he was perfectly obedient to them. In that love, he willingly allowed his enemies to crucify him. In that love, he gave up his spirit and he, he willingly died for us. In that love, he was willing to take our punishment to suffer hell in our place for us. No one has greater love than that. That Jesus was willing to lay down his life for us. People who at that time were not even his friends, but who are by nature his, his enemies. And he doesn't even stop there. In that selfless, sacrificial love, he comes to us and he gives us the gift of faith. He unites us to himself. He teaches us about that love. He pours it out on us. He clothes us in his righteousness. He forgives our sins. He names us not only his friends, but children of God. And it's through this that we have been equipped to go out into the world and to love the people that God has specifically put into your life. Right? You are uniquely gifted in the relationships that you have. You have relationships that no one else has, connections that no one else has. And God has given you these relationships and connections 
to do this, to reflect the love that he has poured out on you. To love them enough to, to help them in, in their earthly needs. To be a genuine friend. To love them enough to share with them the, the hope on which you stand, the confidence on which you've built your entire life, that of Christ and him crucified. To love them enough to not just want to have a relationship with them that is for this time here and now, but is an eternal relationship. He has equipped you to love other people by showing you this love and giving it to you first. Now, motivated by that love, listen to what Jesus is urging you to do in our text for today. He's saying, I love you so much that I'm going to give you these commands. I'm going to give you these reminders. And one of the the big ones is this. He says, remain in my love. That's a command. And it's kind of a strange one when you think about it. If my kids woke up and they said, what do we have to do today? And I said, be loved by me. That would be a, a strange thing to say, right? A strange command to give us. Remain in my love. What is Jesus actually telling us to do? We know that his love is unconditional. It is, it is always there for us. It doesn't go away. And yet while we are on this earth, we have enemies uh, of, of, of our faith, enemies of, of Christ's people who are trying to drag us away from that love. It's the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh, that sinful nature within us that tries to convince us that there's something better out there in the world. There's something more fulfilling, more comforting than the love of God. Jesus is saying, remain in my love. Remain in my love by being reminded of his love. By growing in grace and in your knowledge of the truth of that love. By being in his word. Remain in his love by coming to church. Right? A, a pretty low effort thing that, that we do, but one that's full of so many blessings. As co- God comes and serves us with his word by pointing us back and reminding to the love that, that he has loved us with. Come back next week and, be re- and remain in his love by receiving the body and blood that our Savior has given and shed for you. Through which we, we, we know my sins have been forgiven. I have been once again united with my Savior and I am going to heaven. Remain in his love by holding on to his commands. By continuing to do the things that he has instructed you. Knowing that, that his law is there not, not to hold us back, not to make it so that we have to, to uh, prove that we're good enough, not to hold us back from doing the things that we want to do, but it's there because of his love. And the goal of that love is to have the peace and joy of God himself dwelling within you and for that joy to be complete. The more we learn about the love that, that God has shown to us, the more that we learn about our God who is love, the more complete that joy is. And the more equipped we are to to go and bear that fruit that endures, that fruit of faith, that fruit of love. So whether you are a grade schooler today or a preschooler or an octogenarian, take heart in knowing that God has chosen you. And that yes, he has uniquely and individually equipped you to serve in love in whatever your vocation might be. And this is not for someday. Okay, so if you are in school, this is not for when you graduate, then you're going to be prepared to to reach out to people in love. This is not someday when your kids are grown and out of the house and you have more time, you will be equipped to love. This is not, well, someday when I I retire, then I'll have more time on my hands, then I'm equipped to go out and and show love. He has equipped you to do this today. God has, has equipped us by giving us new life through baptism. He has equipped us by giving us this rock-solid foundation of his word through which he reminds us of his love, through which he teaches us more and more about this love. He, he has given us and equipped us the, through the, the sacrament of communion, where, where we, which we call food for the way, sustenance for our spiritual life, through which we, we receive strength to continue living for him. He has equipped us by pouring out on us so richly the love that we are called to share with the world. A love that is rooted and founded in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his Son, and our Lord. The salvation that he won for us. That means that we get to experience and live in the love of God forever with him in heaven. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. The peace which surpasses all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You may be